acompanhar Pelo sim, pelo não ah, Andar com fé eu vou Porque a fé não costuma falhar Andar com fé eu vou Porque a fé não costuma falhar Andar com fé eu vou Porque a fé não costuma falhar Oh, lele, oh, lá, lá Andar com fé eu vou Porque a fé não costuma falhar Ei, Andar com fé eu vou Porque a fé não costuma falhar Andar com fé eu vou Porque a fé não costuma falhar Andar com fé eu vou Porque a fé não costuma falhar Oh, lele, oh, lá, lá Andar com fé eu vou Porque a fé não costuma falhar Andar com fé eu vou, café não costuma falhar. Andar com fé eu vou, café não costuma falhar. Andar com fé eu vou, café não costuma falhar. Andar com fé eu vou, café não costuma falhar. Andar com fé eu vou, café não costuma falhar. Andar com fé eu vou, café não costuma falhar. Andar com fé eu vou, café não costuma falhar. Andar com fé eu vou, café não costuma falhar. Andar com fé eu vou, café não costuma falhar. Andar com fé eu vou, café não costuma falhar. Andar com fé eu vou, café não costuma falhar. Olá a todos, muito boa noite. Dani, a gente está pronto para o live stream no YouTube? Está rodando? Sim, tudo certo. Olá. Pessoal, boa noite. Aqui é o Arnob Morelli, CEO da Sirius Education. E é um prazer para mim muito grande dar boas-vindas para vocês é, na nossa série de masterclasses. E a de hoje com o meu amigo Martin Gonzalez, do Google Califórnia, que vai falar para a gente sobre Organizational Analytics e como usar dados para tomar decisões dentro de empresas e dados em torno de estratégia de pessoas, de retenção e mais. É, a gente está super animado por ter ele aqui com a gente hoje. Nesse dia, né, nós vamos ter dois momentos, um momento em que a gente está tendo essa, essa masterclass aberta no YouTube e um outro momento de bate-papo, perguntas e respostas. É, parte desse bate-papo vai ser é, disponível na live para quem está assistindo com a gente via YouTube ou LinkedIn. E outra parte, não, vai ser um momento é, em que a gente vai concluir a live, vai ter um momento mais íntimo com os alunos e comunidades da Sirius. E a Sirius, que é a faculdade que está é, moderando, hosteando esse evento aqui com a gente hoje. Para quem ainda não conhece, a Sirius Education é a, a primeira né, universidade do Brasil e nós trabalhamos para elevar a carreira de vocês com tecnologia e ciência de dados, mesmo para quem ainda não tem domínio técnico. A Sirius é uma das 15 startups mais promissoras do, da América Latina, de acordo com, as, com a Forbes, uma das 100 melhores edtechs do continente, de acordo com o Hall on IQ Global Summit, e, entre outras coisas, nós fazemos essa série de, de masterclasses. Um breve é, programa que a Sirius está rodando agora, que eu queria compartilhar com vocês, é sobre o nosso Master in Data e Decision Science. E aí, claro, né, essa Masterclass hoje do Martin tem tudo a ver com esse tema. E o objetivo desse programa, que é uma pós-graduação, uma instituição reconhecida pelo MEC com nota máxima, é elevar sua carreira de patamar em nove meses com ciência de dados. E a gente faz isso de três formas. A primeira é que o curso é 100% aplicado, ele não tem disciplina, só tem projetos, então o tempo inteiro você vai, você vai estar entregando é, desafios, que é do contexto do seu trabalho, do trabalho dos seus colegas. A segunda coisa que a gente faz nesse programa é construir seu network com ícones do mercado, é, como o Martin, que está aqui com a gente hoje. Então, nossos professores e mentores são galera com experiência no, 
é, Nubank, iFood, Singular University, o próprio Google. E a terceira coisa que a gente faz nesse programa é o compromisso com o seu crescimento de carreira no longo prazo. É, na maioria das escolas, o compromisso dela com você acaba no diploma. É, na Sirius não é assim. E assim, eu não sei vocês, né? Mas às vezes eu até me sinto esquecido pelos lugares onde eu formei. Na Sirius não é assim. Depois que você se forma, a gente tem um programa de 12 meses de fellowship, com imersão no Vale do Silício, imersão no Brasil, série de masterclasses como essa que a gente está tendo hoje, mentoria coletiva e fóruns em ciência da decisão. Para quem quiser aprender mais, visite esse link aqui abaixo, ou vai direto no site da Sirius. Eu vou pedir o apoio é, da produção para me ajudar a postar também esse link, por gentileza, no YouTube. Então, esse é o programa de Mastering Data e Decision Science da Sirius, que eu convido vocês para conhecer. Hoje, é, o evento é a Masterclass do Martin, que vai ensinar para a gente como solucionar problemas organizacionais usando dados. O Martin é, trabalha hoje no Google, ele é um, um executivo lá, faz Organizational Development, e ele tem uma carreira sensacional. É, eu, eu sigo o trabalho dele há anos, nós nos conhecemos quando é, ele ainda mora no Vale do Silício, eu morava lá até o começo desse ano, é, é onde nós nos conhecemos, ele fez uma porção de projetos sensacionais. É, um deles é um projeto que se chama Effective Founders Project, que é para usar dados para entender que, que, que tipo de empreendedor performa melhor e como empreendedores podem funcionar melhor. Eles fizeram isso, uma pesquisa com founders do mundo inteiro no projeto do Google for Startups e estão publicando um livro, que talvez ele vai mencionar um pouco mais é, durante o dia hoje. O Martin dá palestras e aulas em diversas faculdades, como a Stanford University, em SEAD, a Sirius, e nós estamos muito felizes e honrados por ter ele aqui com a gente hoje. A Masterclass será em inglês. O pessoal que está aqui no Google Meet, é, você pode usar legendas. E como é que você acha essas legendas? É, tem um... um no, no seu... Na parte de baixo do seu monitor, tem três bolinhas que você pode criar. Clicar mais opções, settings... E aí tem uma opção de captions, ou legendas. E aí você pode ligar essas legendas em inglês e colocar a tradução também, se você quiser. Então, o Masterclass vai ser em inglês. E na hora de pergunta e resposta, quem precisar de ajuda, é só me falar. É, e agora eu vou transicionar para falar em inglês com, com a, aqui no evento de hoje. Martin, we're so excited to have you, have you with us today. Thank you so much for being here. And we're all excited to learn more from you. Thank you. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Arnovia. It's, it's great to be here and um, great to see you all. Um, I, I don't know any Portuguese except for panja queixo, which is like my favorite Brazilian thing to eat. So, um, but I love your country and I, and I hope to be there at some point soon. Um, I've been looking forward to having this uh, conversation with you all. Um, and really what I'd love to talk about for the next few minutes are just some ideas, um, some inspiration around how we might take some of the methods of data analytics um, into the problem space of organizational design and organizational development. In 1948, a small town near Boston called Framingham launched one of the most ambitious research studies in all of medical history at that point they started what they called the heart study which followed some 5,000 people across the years and today they have they have followed about three generations of um of people who live in this town and based on this longitudinal study they were actually able to um discover things that you would otherwise not be able to learn even in a randomized control experiment the way drugs are discovered um, a lot of what is known today around cardiovascular health like um, the effects of diet of exercise of um, common medications on on you know on, on the heart like aspirin like all of these really stemmed from this this hundred year study if you will um, uh, 
in Framingham, Massachusetts. There are about 3,000 peer-reviewed journals at this point, uh, journal papers at this point from this study, and it continues to, you know, to offer the world um, a lot of groundbreaking insights into human health. Back in 2014, Laszlo Bach, um, Prasad Seti, and the people analytics team at Google saw this as, a, as, a, as an amazing inspiration and wondered, like, could we take this idea of a 100-year study that was studying the health of the human heart and bring it into um, Google to answer questions around the health of our organization? Uh, and so in 2014, Google actually launched into a similar type longitudinal study, which we call GDNA. Um, and this team called the Pi Lab or the People Innovation Lab within Google uh, built this. And, and even to this day, um, almost, you know, almost 10 years later, um, this study continues to go. And in this study, we've learned so many things about the experience of, um, of Googlers uh, as it relates to their work. We've also learned quite a bit about what it's like to go beyond Google and life after Google, because the, this study then continues to reach out to that same panel of 5,000 people um, to understand the experience post Google. It's studies like these um, that really inspire me to be um, uh, in a place like Google, um, but, it, but more so inspires me to, you know, to participate in helping to evangelize this idea that you know we can actually be very evidence-based and data-based about decisions not just about our business not just about our products but also about the softer side of things which is the people right um you know it, it's funny that when we talk about people issues um oftentimes you know we'll say things like ah that's not rocket science you know it's not rocket science like let's let's just kind of use our best guess our intuition to make people decisions um, What's ironic about calling, you know, this the softer stuff like, like, uh, like people decisions. The the ironic thing of calling it, you know, that it's not rocket science is that we are incredibly good at rocket science. We can actually launch a rocket into the moon and land within something like four kilometers of our target destination. Um, but when we study the human condition, when we study human behavior when we're able to get a correlation factor of 0.5, which means like I can explain the behavior of this human being at a 50% level of um, accuracy. The rest really is unpredictable. Um, psychologists will call that a strong correlation, uh, which to an actual rocket scientist will seem uh, pretty laughable, right? And so what's ironic about this space is that it's actually much harder you know, to get accurate um, than actual rocket science. Um, and so before we move on, and I, and I want to share with you kind of ideas within this space on how you might bring data and analytics into people decisions, I just want to make it very clear that, you know, what I do share today does not reflect the views of my employer um, or of, you know, the institutions I, I guest lecture at. Um, these are, you know, these are ultimately uh, my opinions. Um, here's a very simple framework to think about. Um, all what that you might do within an organization as far as analytics is concerned. And I wanna give um, credit where credit is due. This is a framework that had been developed by, by two excellent um, um, academics, uh, and both of them are, are good friends of mine. So Panish Puranam is a chaired professor of strategy at INSEAD, um, and Julian Clement, he's a professor of organization behavior um, in Stanford. And, and I've had the good fortune of actually guest lecturing in their classes uh, over the past maybe some seven years now. But uh, uh, Panesh and, and Julian, they talk about these three levels of sophistication as far as organizational analytics is concerned. So there's really the broad base, and a lot of this you probably all already really know, um, is the level of perception, um, or you might say descriptive analytics, right? Um, it's using data to understand what is currently going on. It's um, it's things like employment sentiment surveys, exit surveys. Um, it's a it's a really 
good and quite efficient way of testing hunches of understanding you know what is going on in the organization we'll go deep in a sec the second level above that is is really prediction and and prediction is simply if i can take um a, a huge data set um and if i'm able to then use some kind of machine learning um to make predictions on that data set um it allows me then to anticipate certain things um that you know more basic math, more basic arithmetic won't be able to anticipate. And then the third level is really prototyping. And prototyping is this idea where can I develop an alternative organization um, or alternative forms of organizing? And before I fully launch this into the, you know, into the organization, can I test it in a place in a way that is small scale but rigorous and I can establish some kind of causality? If I do A, I will get B. Um, and so we'll we'll talk about each of these areas in part. Um, and so let's start with the first one, right? So perception. Um, a lot has been said about this, and and really these methods have been around for easily fifty years. Um, but I think there are some really cool things that have emerged over the past uh, maybe decade that I think has really sharpened the way we're able to really understand organizations. Uh, one of my um, my intellectual sandboxes, if you will, that I've really enjoyed understanding their work um, is this company called Humanize. It was actually founded by um, by um, Weber, who came from the MIT Media Lab. Um, and what Humanize does, or at least did pre-pandemic, um, was they had these um, they developed this technology that they call so social metric ba badges. And what these, how these work are, you would wear these badges um, as you would wear, uh, you know, a, a work ID, you wear it around your your neck, and around the office they would outfit it with RFID sensors. Now this badge is able to then understand where you're moving through the space um, of an, you know, through, through an office space. It can also listen to your own, um, to to how you're speaking. It it knows who you're speaking to. Um, it will understand, you know, the sentiment level of how you're speaking compared to how um, the other person that you're speaking to is speaking. It will even measure like what percentage of time you're speaking compared to the other people in the room. Um, and there have been some really cool analysis done out of this kind of technology. Um, one thing that they had presented maybe in about 2015 or 2016 was they did some studies on, um, on banks. And they looked at the difference between a very simple difference between structuring the bank building as a single floor bank branch, um, or if you had two floors. And essentially, they discovered that if you have two floors, you can actually hurt the effectiveness of that bank branch by a certain amount because the, the sheer distance, physical distance between you know the people on the first floor, the people on the second floor, actually severs to some extent, the amount of collaboration that happens uh, between those teams. And so they've done things like, can we relocate the, the coffee machine in the office simply by um, knowing that by doing so, you actually get a lot more collaboration with the teams you want to collaborate more by doing a small tweak like that. And they've been able to use this technology to actually do that with a lot, with a lot of accuracy. Um, and so there's a lot more that's done in this space of perception or descriptive analytics. And I'll, I'll leave it at that because I, I feel like the world has seen a lot of that. But I want to spend a lot more time on prediction prototyping. But the thing to, to, to say about prediction is that when you're doing predictive analytics, really you're still ultimately doing um, correlational studies. Granted that these are highly, you know, very high correlations, very strong predictions because you're able to then bring together data but it's just very it's very important to just say that that you know prediction or predictive analytics somehow creates a black box it doesn't help us understand why certain things emerge why certain um phenomena emerge in an organization it just simply allows us to predict that it will happen and predictive analytics if we were to kind of demarcate or or identify when this really first um when it first, when predictive analytics first captured the imagination of the world, 
it was really back in 2012 um, when there was this big case that was that was put against Target by a father, um, and the father sued Target because he had seen that Target was starting to send mailers. Um, mailers is a very American thing. I, I, I realize mailers are simply like brochures about what Target sells, and Target's a retailer here in the U.S. But they were sending mailers um, to to his daughter um, that was meant for for expectant mothers, so diapers, um, strollers, uh, formula milk, whatnot. And the father thought that it was incredibly inappropriate to be sending a teenage his teenage daughter these kinds of uh, advertising. So he sues Target, only to find out, you know, a few a few weeks later that actually his daughter was actually pregnant and that Target actually knew that well before um, her father actually found out. Um, and this is simply like, the, and this kind of took the world by storm. It was a little bit of a shocker. Um, this is kind of the power of predictive analytics, the small breadcrumbs of data that you leave on the internet or that you leave as you go about your life. Um, you know, machine learning algorithm can actually pick that up and, you know, make predictions, likely, you know, likelihood statements about, um, you know, about certain things, in this case, pregnancy. But that was actually not where it all began. Um, there have been much older technologies that do a lot of predictive analytics. Um, and this is one of my favorite ones um, that comes out of MIT Media Lab. Um, they call it a jerkometer. So this is actually a, an old, I don't know if you all remember PDAs or personal digital assistants, if I'm getting that correctly. Bob Pilot kind of was a player in that space. So they outfitted a PDA with um with this uh with this software that listens to the way someone speaks when they're in like a professional setting and based on sentiment analysis of how they're speaking and what they're saying basically this this software will rate how much of a jerk you are um in those settings um i don't know if you all saw that um the big bang theory sheldon in big bang theory actually has has an episode where they play around with this technology but it's been around for in this case, you know, a bit more than 20 years now. Um, and you'll see a lot more of, of these use cases inside organizations, right? Um, you know, IBM made a big splash when they, you know, they claimed that they could use artificial intelligence to predict with a good amount of accuracy when workers are about to quit. Um, today, today, being able to predict um, who's leaving the organization before they actually resign it's pretty mainstream at this point. Um, and I think this is where it's probably very important to say that there are some very clear drawbacks, trade-offs around, um, around predictive analytics. Um, when pressed in this article in CNBC, actually, they press um, the IBM chief. Um, so what, you know, what data are you collecting on employees to know that they're about to leave? Uh, but this is where you start to get into you know, the space of, Cool analytics that actually are, you know, it's pretty creepy, right? Um, we, we don't know actually what I, what the IBM um, uh, AI would would look at, but in seeing this done in other organizations, like things like how much are they taking time off from work? How much are they actually going on LinkedIn using their using their devices? Um, how how much do they decline meetings? Uh, how has their email traffic actually um, slow down relative to the, you know, to their average behavior. Uh, and a lot of these things start to get into the space of, uh, of privacy issues, right? Um, now, granted, like you will still see organizations who will be able to figure out ways around that. But, but one thing to say that the world is moving in a place where GDPR, which is really mostly, you know, the, the Europe that kind of um, has really, led the way in terms of privacy issues, um, I expect the world to, to follow suit, right? Um, and so, so a few trade-offs to keep in mind, right, when, you, when we're doing this in organizations. It's, the first one is this idea of whether, it, uh, you know, being, uh, is, is between cool analysis and creepy data collection practices, right? Um, I don't think actually that this is a trade-off that needs to exist. I think there are ways, and, and I think over time, what I'm hoping to see and think that I am also working on um, on my end is how do we actually break this trade-off between cool and creepy analytics? 
can we actually begin to do privacy preserving methods um, as we collect data on, you know, on employees? When I, when I think of that idea, I think very much about the, the huge debate that exists within the self-driving car industry. In the self-driving car industry, there's a big, big debate about the core technology that they would use in terms of perception of the, you know, of the world around the car. Um, primarily, there are two technologies that have, that have been in constant debate. Um, LiDAR technology, which uses laser technology to then um, sense the surroundings and the distance uh, between things around them. Uh, and by the way, the technology that is in Uber or in Waymo, which is a, an alphabet company, um, uses this technology. Later is the first. The second one are, are your, your good old cameras. And you know, like high, you know, high, you know, high tech cameras. But this is kind of the technology that that Tesla has has bet on. Now, between those two, lighter technology is actually much more privacy preserving because it only understands the you know the the perimeters of objects, um, the velocity by which they're coming towards you, the distance, um, and really not much more. Like if I if there was a person crossing the street. Um, camera technology will pick up the face of that person, whereas um, you know, whereas lighter technology will you know will struggle to actually pick up some of that. Um, so I'm asking myself, like, what is the organizational equivalent of this? Like, is there a way that we can actually mask um, and anonymize data at the collection level, um, so that we can then do a lot more of this really predictive analytics um, without stepping on you know, privacy issues. Um, the other technology that, that comes to mind is also if, if you've all used um, Xbox um, Connect, uh, which is they use um, they use radio frequencies to then also see kind of the movement, the gestures of people without really collecting um, identifiable data, right? Um, so I think one day we will see a day where we can actually break this trade-off. The other trade-off with, you know, with, uh, with, um, uh, predictive analytics is is the trade-off between accuracy and explainability. Um, and if we come back to this example of you know predicting uh, f flight risk or whether people or the employees will quit or not, what we found in you know in in many organizations that have, that have adopted this technology is you can actually truly predict that people are leaving. But ultimately, what you want to do is to get manage that the manager of that individual to start acting ahead of time. To then minimize the chance of them leaving. Now, this is where predictive analytics really falls short because you jam in so many different data points about the person that when it's ready to now give guidance to a manager to say, look, we think that your person is going to leave in the next two weeks or three weeks. Um, you know, let's let's drop a plan to help prevent them from leaving. The model will sometimes not, well, oftentimes I should say, not give you good guidance there. Um, imagine being told that, well, we know this because they're on their LinkedIn um, page more often, they're absent more often. Um, that doesn't give a lot for the manager to then dig in and, and figure out an action plan. Um, and so in many ways, you can predict what might be coming, but if you can't actually prevent it from happening, then what is the real value of that prediction, right? Um, and so that's where I see a lot of companies um, giving up on some of these um, techniques simply because of this trade-off. Um, the last one is maybe the, a, a less in, intuitive trade-off, which is more and more we're seeing that trust is becoming an issue around the use of these algorithms. Um, and you might imagine that by increasing the transparency you know, of these algorithms, you can actually increase the trust. And there's actually some research that's been done um, where actually the more you increase transparency, the less trusting people will be um, of this technology. Um, there's some really cool research done out of Wharton um, around this idea called algorithm aversion. And in this study, what they do is they have, you know, they, they offer people two options. So they offer them to use an algorithm with an error rate of 8% or to rely on their human judgment, which they know to have an error rate of 31%. And what they do in this experiment is that they expose, um, they, they expose the individuals 
uh, to different conditions. The first condition is that they don't see any of these error rates. The second condition is they only see the human error rate. And the third condition is they see only the algorithm's error rate. Now, any rational human being will look at these error rates of 8 and 31% respectively and say, hey, look, we should choose the algorithm each and every time, right? But what the study showed was actually when asked whether you would rely on your human instincts to do this forecasting um, activity, when they when they do when they either not when they're not exposed to any of the error rates or they only see the human error rate, the tendency for them to trust is pretty high. But the moment you you expose to them the the, the error rate of the algorithm, you'll see in this in this chart that their trust over the algorithm or their, I should say their trust in their own human forecast is so much higher that only 26% um, will actually choose the algorithm over the human forecast. An incredibly irrational thing to choose, um, but what these, um, what these researchers uh, begin to explain is that, you know, the problem with, with algorithms is the error rate is knowable. Whereas while we can know what the human error rate is, somehow humans have this belief that we are perfectible and that while the past error rate is 31%, surely my error rate could be closer to zero. Um, and so whether this is a, a good thing or a bad thing, this is something to contend with as we do more and more um, of these AI-based uh, predictive analytics. In fact, these, these researchers also then did a follow-up study where they said, look, what if, we, what if we offered people a chance to make tweaks to the algorithm? Um, what they discovered was that if I allowed someone to make a tweak to the algorithm and thereby actually increasing the error rate, they are more likely to actually trust the higher error rate that I can control as opposed to the lower error rate that I cannot control. That, that clues you in even more to kind of the human condition that we care so much about control. All right. So that's kind of the space of, of you know, prediction. I think the last area or the last level of sophistication is this idea of prototyping. And again, the idea here is like, you know, I can describe what's going on and I might be able to predict what the future might bring. But can I perhaps um, understand what are the causal relationships within what we, you know, in, within kind of organizational phenomenon? If I actually tweak this part of how a manager leads or how we run meetings or perhaps how we organize the space like, can we actually know for sure what the impact will be on metrics that we care about um, and really the idea behind prototyping um, is really the scientific method at its best right um, you may you may have heard of randomized control experiments or a b tests but this is really the gold standard in understanding this is the gold standard in science but there's the gold standard in understanding cause and effect, right? The only time you can truly understand whether A causes B is by setting up an experiment where you have a control group and a treatment group, where you randomly assign them to these groups and you administer a treatment to the treatment group and you hold everything else um, constant with the, with the control group. And then you measure the outcome of these two groups and look, like the treatment group, you could have five, you can have 10 treatment groups, but you would then measure the outcome um, of the control group and all these other treatment groups. Um, and, if, and, if it, and, and if the outcome isn't the same, then you can actually confidently, if you do the randomization correctly, you can confidently say that the, that the outcome is because you can draw an attribution to the, to the treatment um, or to the intervention, right? And you know, without giving you the crash course on the philosophy of knowledge and why we know what we know, Essentially, what you're trying to do is you're trying to understand, you're trying to build a counterfactual, right? The counterfactual is simply like, if I didn't do, if I didn't do this, this intervention, what would we see? What would we see as an, as, an, as an outcome? You know, one way to think about this idea of a counterfactual is maybe using um, Google Maps. Um, so this is a, a map that I, like maybe yesterday uh, generated, going from the Google Sao Paulo office um, to a bakery that I suspect has Panjakesho. Um, and, you know, the Google Maps gives me three routes, right? It gives me one that will take me 
take me there in 22 minutes, in 29 minutes, and in 30 minutes. Now, if the question I want to ask is, what route do I take to, to get me there the fastest? Well, what's, the, you know, what's a good way to actually answer that question? So one way is I could take each route one at a time. So I'll take the first route, and then I'll take, you know, the, and then I'll measure how long it will take. I'll take the second route and measure how long it will take, and take the third route and measure how long it will take. Well, the problem with, with that approach is that we don't know what the traffic conditions will be on the second and third rounds. We don't know how exhausted I might be as a driver, so I may be driving slower on those second and third rounds. And so, well, okay, well, why don't I ask two other friends to take two, the two other routes? And let's see who gets there fa the fastest. That's also a, a decent way to figure out the fastest route. The problem is that, you know, they might have different types of cars. Maybe their car might be a faster car. Maybe their driving skills or their driving speed is much higher. And so actually, even, even on this second approach, it's really not a great way to understand, to answer this question, what's the fastest route, right? And really what you want is you want to take all three routes yourself on the same date and time using the same car with the same mood of driving, whether I feel like driving fast or slow, the same everything. And you want to you want to do that all at the same time. Now, as an individual, that's basically impossible. But this is where kind of the idea of an A-B test is quite brilliant, because if I can actually have two other Martins at the very same time, go through the same route. And if one of these Martins actually gets, and, and by the way, one of these Martins in the same car that Martin has, um, and, if, and whoever gets there first, well, we can actually definitively with confidence say that that person, that version of Martin got there first, that route that that Martin took is actually the right route. Now, the beauty is that you can actually do that in in groups so if you can actually get a large enough group and divide them randomly into three different groups essentially you would have identical three identical groups and that allows you to then play around with very specific um things um in this case the routes in a b testing jargon it would be the interventions and that way you can then definitively say look if we did a then b will be the result right and so this is kind of the intuition or the basic understanding of what prototyping ultimately is, right? And, and you see a lot of that actually in academia and more and more companies are doing this, right? Here's a really um, interesting study and a very recent um, and very influential study by, by Nick Bloom, who is based in Stanford and, and colleagues. And they, and they ran an experiment on a Chinese um, uh, company, I believe it was a call center setup. I, I might be getting that, that detail wrong, but they actually ran a randomized control experiment. They had a control group and a treatment group. The control group continued to do what they were doing, which is to stay in the office and do the work there. The treatment group was, was they said, go home and do your work there. And they measured
but they had evolved that culture through the years. And so you can see a very stark difference at times between Google's culture and this acquired um, company's culture. And to then begin to figure out like to what extent do we want Google to adopt the other culture or to what extent do we want the other startup to, to adopt the Google culture? Well, that becomes a really great tr uh, testing ground for some of these experiments, some of these ideas. Um, and so we would, you know, we would conduct some of these experiments and again, set it up like a true experiment um, where we had a control group and, to ex and several experimental groups to then understand the impact of certain cultural tweaks that we would do um, on these teams. Um, and again, with this data, you can then confidently say that these interventions actually work. Now, prototyping, prototyping is an expensive thing. And this is one of the drawbacks of, you know, of this approach to analytics in organizational settings. Um, there are many issues around it too. Like you deprive a group of the treatment. So in the case of, you know, experimenting with salaries, you might have to like give someone more salary and withhold salary from, from other people. And this is why we don't see a lot of experiments done on compensation, right? Um, and there are many, so there are many issues around that. Um, and so what we would say is that if you want to, and you know, I should give credit to, to Panish and, and Julian again on this, um, but what you wanna say is that when the cost of failure is big and the, and the benefits of success are also big, then you should definitely think about prototyping. But if you're pretty sure that it's a no brainer that this is going to be a huge upside with almost very little downside, then there's almost no reason why you should prototype. You should just roll things out right away and implement things right away. Um, there are some, you know, there are some scenarios where, you know, you would not go take this step. You you launch a big um, a big effort. You know, you will see like an uplift in something. You will you will never know by without setting up a control group. You'll never know what what would have happened if you know if you just let the group evolve over time. And what you'll actually see in in, in some of our 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 experiments with um, in the M and A setting is that when you leave a startup organization on their own and you and you did not do anything to the control group, you will actually see movement. You'll actually see them come closer to the Google uh, to the Google norm or to the dominant culture, I should say, it might not always be the Google culture. They will, they will approximate the, the, the dominant culture, even if you did nothing. And that's really valuable information to have because then it allows you to then prioritize how much effort or resources do I put behind, you know, introducing new interventions um, to this group. All right. One last thought before we wrap up and would be super happy to uh, to take questions is there is actually a way to lower the cost of prototyping. Um, and this is, uh, I guess, um, very nascent, a very nascent approach, a very early approach. Um, it's, you know, method, method, methodologically, we're still trying to figure out like, how do we actually do this well within an organization? But um, there's this, in, there's this idea, and the photo you have here is from NASA, where, you know, in, in, a, in, a, in a scenario where you want to test uh, an aircraft, to do a proper experiment, which is let's actually fly the plane out in the open field and see if it crashes, that's actually not a great way to actually run an experiment, right? The cost of that would be way too high. And so what they do actually in aviation science is they will actually create wind tunnels that very closely simulate actual the actual environment um, when a plane is up in the air. And that way you can then tweak and understand to a very, very close, and it, it, it allows you to then simulate reality to a very, very close degree. And that allows you to then do the experimentation within safer bounds and lower cost bounds. Uh, more and more, you know, we're hearing these, um, kind of the, these ideas of creating a digital twin of an organization. Can I actually upload all the information I have about an organization into the cloud. And can I run my experiments in the cloud? Can I actually assign control and experimental groups, run those treatments as if they were in real life and see what the outcomes are. And if that can approximate real life, then it allows me to then save the trouble of experimenting on actual human beings and instead, and instead um, 
experimenting on the digital versions of those human organizations. I have not, full disclosure, I have not done work like this yet. Um, I am itching to figure out the right use case to, to do this. But I think this is actually some exciting stuff that's coming down in the next few years. So that's what I wanted to cover, really the three levels of sophistication, organizational analytics. Um, and I think at some point, you know, there will be much more to uncover. Um, but as far as I can see, these are kind of the, you know, these are the best in class tools that, that exist today as far as organizational design questions are concerned. All right, I am happy to take questions now um, and you know, we can go from there. Fantastic, Martin. Thank you so much for sharing this with us and for being able to chat. We're, we're really excited. We got some questions from YouTube that I wanna share with you. Great. Uh, one of them is from Caroline Levy and she asks, People will usually leave companies because of their managers. And when you're doing this organizational analytics work, how do you bring that to build, to gather action plans with the managers to change behavior? Yeah. Um, so the first thing I want to say is that, again, in the spirit, so the, the whole idea of doing analytics is that we almost do not take any best practice and just assume that it's true in your organization. So I would not make the assumption that people are leaving your company because of the manager. In fact, um, there was a big splash that Adam Grant actually um, published recently in the New York Times, I believe. We're looking at Facebook data, so not Google, and Facebook, the company, not the you know not the social networking data but you look at the, the facebook data and they basically said look this idea that people leave managers and not companies is actually false in facebook and when they look at actually the, the reasons for that it's many other things that are important to address and it's not you know but people are anyway happy with their managers right in some ways we you know i can I, you know i've seen that in other organizations too where you know there are other things that get in the way of people leaving um, there's another thing that I actually discovered recently that a colleague of mine shared that in, in her prior organization, you know, they would collect exit data and ask them, like, why are you leaving? Um, and the top reason that was given was career development. I can't seem to, you know, build, I can't get promoted. I can't, you know, I can't pursue my career goals in this organization. But what they pulsed the people who left six months later, they actually discovered, and again, do this study for your for your organization. Don't trust this data exists uh, or 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 generalizes to your organization. Um, what they discovered after six months was that when they chatted with those people who left, it turned out that actually it was the manager that they were trying to escape. But it was just the easier reason to give on exit. It was the more courteous, the more respectful thing to say that it was career development as opposed to throwing my manager under the bus, right? And so you want. Want to ask back to the question, like, so how do we then engage? So, if let's say it was true that managers were the linchpin, were the reason why people were leaving, um, I think the data should speak for itself, right? Like, if you can actually collect that data from within your organization and and share that back with the org and really show them what are the behaviors of a manager that actually frustrates people enough to leave, then you then you almost don't have to do so much more convincing to engage the manager population uh, in taking ownership of the work and really thinking through really robust um, plans on how to, how to avoid this from happening. In many ways, like it's the lazy thing to do, right? It, it's a lazy thing to do to run an experiment and then to, or, or to do the analytics and then to then just let the numbers speak for itself because then it allows you to, to field any objections of like, oh, you're HR, of course you'll think this. But you can very easily just point to the data and say, look, this is not me. This is your data, and this is what the data tells us. Um, and obviously, there's some, there's some caveats around, you know, that data itself have some, you know, have some limitations. And, some, and there's some research actually out of Yale that show that even very smart, quantitative people are able to look at data and mold the data somehow 
to confirm their own prior biases. And so that exists as well, right? But um, but that's but having data is better than having many opinions, um, is my opinion. Fantastic. I think those were two wonderful lessons that you brought here that that resonated with me. One of them is don't assume that what's generally true is true at your organization. I thought yeah. that was really good. And then the second thing was uh, dig deeper behind the this surface level explanation, right? Because yeah. it, it might not always be the case. I thought that was great. Thank you. Yeah. We have a question from Carolina Yamauchi. Uh, Carolina, I hope I said your name right. Sorry if I did it. Uh, and she asked, how do you actively work with organizations to develop data and analytics literacy when you don't have that? She's got a part two that I'll ask afterwards. Great. So I would say that the that the that maybe a way to introduce that to the team is to figure out what are the big like what is one big strategic project that the company is trying to engage in. And I would anchor your efforts, your pilot efforts around um, analytics behind that. Um, because I think that those high priority, high risk, high visibility projects are a like they they run the risk of being very a uh, very visible failure for the company um or they or their upside is likely to be really high otherwise it wouldn't be a high priority project right and so i think if you have those two things where the cost is high but the upside is also potentially high i think you will probably to have some of these safeguards. You know, a lot of the analytics really helps to de-risk the success of these efforts. And I have found that by doing that within those, you know, those project spaces, I think it's probably, um, you know, a good way forward. The other thing I would say is that there are parts of the org that are more friendly to this approach, your R&D groups, your engineering groups, um, your groups that have large scale um, organizations like customer service is actually a really good place to introduce these ideas because, you have the numbers there and a lot of the activity in these kinds of organizations are actually measured through the system data and so you almost don't have to go out and interview people or run surveys you can just collect some of that system data and you can begin to show what could be possible with that um i think where it's a little bit harder to do this is design organizations where the work that you do is hard to compare apples to apples or um or business organizations i find that they're so just ready to go out into the market and, and do their selling and um and they you know they they tend to go with their intuition about you know how, how to go about their work um so those are a few suggestions excellent thank you and uh a part two of the the que that question that came up from carolina is how do you avoid biases on decision making as you're doing that yeah um so that is another master class to be delivered um but let me give you a few um a few important biases that i think you should look out for um and by the way this space of bias and i've spent a good number of years really looking deeply into this um there are maybe 100 200 300 biases that have been documented and really there are only very few biases that have stood the test of scrutiny where it seems to be that these biases are prevalent across humanity, across cultures, across contexts, and that they are maybe potentially even pre-human. So like our, you know, our evolutionary ancestors um, seem to have the same biases. So let me tell you what they are. So confirmation bias uh, is one big one. Confirmation bias is when um, you look at you look at evidence around you and you dismiss the evidence that doesn't conform to your idea or your opinion, and then you only accept the evidence that um, that supports your idea. Oh, and and by the way, like like this is also even more um, uh, this this confirmation bias exists as I mentioned earlier among really intelligent people because they can actually they have the, the aptitude to actually look at numbers and poke holes um, or not or choose not to poke holes. So one way to, to help um, address confirmation bias um, is you want to actually give 
going into the session. So you might even, practically speaking, before you even present the data, you might even ask them, so, um, so what do you think about this issue? Or where do you think we should intervene? Or what solutions should we consider around this issue? Um, in some places, we call this like belief audit, um, or simply put, like uh, uh, kind of, uh, you want to just do interviews ahead of time for this, with the stakeholders to understand where they're at. It allows you to then very clearly clash with that opinion and say something to the extent of like, 80% of this group believes A, um, but, the, but the, somehow the data doesn't bear it out. This is what the data shows. That small stylistic approach, I think, helps mitigate some of the um, some of the confirmation bias. The only other thing I would say is um, the other, only other bias that I think um, that you should be aware of is this idea called loss aversion. And again, these two things, well researched, seems to be generalized across the population. Um, uh, the second bias of um, uh, uh, of loss aversion is that. I fear losing something more than I will love gaining something. So instead of saying something like, um, by doing this effort, we will improve our performance by 20%, um, it's actually usually more powerful to say something like, if, I, if you don't do this effort, you stand the chance of losing X percent in revenue. Usually that second statement is more powerful, even if you're talking about exactly the same statistic, right? Um, and so there's a certain loss aversion um, that comes into play. I would say that when you're presenting your data, be very mindful of how, how, you, how you position the interpretation of that data. Because sometimes if you take the loss frame or the negative frame, you might inadvertently create um, deeper, um, um, a deeper held belief about the data than you actually want to. Um, anyway, again, this might be a whole other um, a whole other master class that we can dig into. Fantastic. Thank you, Martin. Uh, now we're uh, I'm gonna do two things. Oh, thank you so much for being with us on this live stream today. Uh, I'm gonna switch to Portuguese briefly. We're gonna close the YouTube live stream uh, and I'll share my my screen briefly. Um, So, thank you very much. Uh, obrigado a todos que participaram aqui com a gente hoje. Muito feliz de ter vocês com esse bate-papo com o Martin. Obrigado para as pessoas aí que compartilharam suas perguntas. Novamente, para quem quer é, elevar sua carreira com ciência de dados e construir seu network com ícones do, do mercado como o Martin. Martin, de Master in Data e Decision Science. É, agora, a gente vai mudar aqui para um, um momento mais íntimo, em que os alunos e, e, e a comunidade de vão poder fazer perguntas e, e ter um bate-papo direto com o Martin. E com isso, a gente conclui o nosso live stream por hoje. Muitíssimo obrigado é, e uma boa noite para vocês. E aí, pessoal da Sirius, podem se manter aqui, a gente vai fazer perguntas agora. Léo, eu vi que 